So I have one more question I want to ask you, and, and uh, you guys are doing great, I want to tell you. Thank you very much for sharing the microphone, for being uh, very open. But I'm going to ask you to answer this next question in seven words or less. Okay, so <laughs> not really, but you understand what I'm saying. So here's the question. What is the biggest misconception about your faith in your opinion? You don't get to speak for all of your faith, just your opinion. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is probably the easiest question you've asked uh, because Christians are known to be incredibly judgmental and uh, condescending to people and to leave people out. Um, specifically, there are communities like um, the uh, lesbian gay community that we have been very outwardly against as a, as a church, um, corporate church, not this church. Uh, let me be very specific on that. Um, we've also, we've had a history of being poorly treating um, interracial marriage, different issues like that, um, because we have a history of being dumb. If I'm honest, um, and how do I respond to that? I'm sorry. Um, that's not a representation of who Jesus Christ was. That's not a representation of who Jesus Christ wants us as his followers to be. Uh, that breaks my heart because it's not that you guys would be wrong in saying that that's who we've been because we have a bad history and a bad reputation, but I challenge you to get to know Jesus before you get to know Christians uh, because Jesus was a pretty stinking awesome dude. Uh, Christians are pretty messy. So the biggest misconception is how we treat specifically minorities, and we've done a very, very bad job, and I apologize. That's pretty much all I can say. One of them would probably be the legalism thing, but uh, I already addressed that. I think the other would be uh, the idea of a chosen people uh, is often, uh, especially because there were certain Protestant sects that had an idea, uh, again, S-E-T, S-E-C-T-S, <laughs> that uh, had an idea that there was the elect and that the elect through no um, work of their own were chosen to go to heaven and everybody else was not. Uh, and so it's sometimes uh, seen through that prism. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Jews don't believe that you have to be Jewish to get into heaven. That's why it's not a proselytizing faith. Uh, and the idea of chosenness is chosen for a particular mission, to be, as it is described in the Torah, an Am Kadosh, a holy nation, uh, uh, a nation of priests, a light unto the other nations, sort of God's ambassador on earth that we are supposed to live in covenant with God and set the example for others and to spread the ideals of ethical monotheism. Uh, Maimonides, uh, perhaps the greatest uh, Jewish sage of the Middle Ages, uh, even described how uh, he saw Christianity and, uh, and Islam, which both in some sense were offspring of Judaism as fulfilling uh, in part that divine role of uh, teaching uh, the, the nations of the world uh, about one God and about the idea of the ultimate redemption of the Messiah. Uh, and so, the, again, this, this misconception, other nations can be chosen and other peoples and individuals can be chosen, chosen for other tasks. Being chosen for a particular task, uh, in this case the task of receiving the revelation at Mount Sinai and then uh, spreading these ideals to the world does not make us better or worse than, than anybody else. So it's not like that idea of the elect. Uh, it's just uh, being an ambassador chosen for a particular mission. I think there's two misconceptions, actually. Uh, one internal within, the, within our faith and probably one external. Um, however, on the external side, we probably could have like a whole lecture evening on the misconceptions of all of our faiths, um, especially uh, for at least for Mormonism. It seems like I spend more time uh, debunking uh, ideas and myths about our faith than I actually do promoting our faith, if that makes sense. Uh, the internal one first uh, would be uh, for members of our faith is the reality of our history and the founding of our faith and how it came to be and how that has framed who we are as members today. Um, members have conflated the institution with the gospel uh, where it wasn't originally intended to be as such. Um, and so there's a lot of information out there, and the church is doing a phenomenal job about being more transparent about that currently. Um, externally, I think the, the one of the ones that I hear most often is whether or not we worship Joseph Smith, um, the prophet. Uh, Joseph Smith is akin to actually Muhammad, who after uh, the prophets had already finished writing the Old and New Testament, received 
a revelation from God to restore or to uh, be a reformer, and he received a book of scripture. Joseph Smith follows suit with Mohammed in that regard where he questioned the faiths of his time and received a revelation that none of the faiths that were represented on earth were true and that he was called to be a prophet. And as a result of that prophet, uh, he was called to translate, not write, additional book of scripture, which was written by ancient prophets that lived here on the American continent. And hand in hand, uh, we use them with the Bible to support the tenets of our faith, uh, which is centered around uh, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I probably would like to begin with your last point, and uh, with, with all due respect. Um, the Prophet Muhammad did not write the Quran, and this is one of, one of the misconceptions that uh, the Quran was directly the word of God, as uh, you know, Muslims believe, uh, dictated by the Archangel Gabriel. The Prophet was illiterate. He did not read or write, and he memorized it by heart, and uh, dictated it to orally to uh, his companions who wrote it down many, many years after his death. The other major differences, actually, um, about Islam, uh, I will just talk about two, many, but the first one is that Islam is oppressive to women, which is far from the truth. I teach a class next semester at BOSU, the Quran text on women. And in fact, it's strikingly contemporary when we see the rights of women mentioned in the Quran itself. And uh, the Quran has been interpreted by men throughout the four past 14 centuries. And the, the interpretation is what reflect, uh, reflects those uh, you know, aspects of what they perceive as oppressive. There is a whole chapter, as I mentioned, in the Quran called Mary, a woman. There is a whole chapter called Women. One of the longest chapters in the Quran is called Women, and Nisa, which is the Arabic for women. There is a whole chapter, chapter 58, which is called She, who pleads, which is a striking story that uh, Muslim feminists today, especially the Muslim feminist scholars, you know, uh, take very much pride in. The other major misconception about Islam is that is it's a religion of terrorism and violence. And um, th this is a, a huge misconception that Muslims themselves are guilty of, especially the extremists and the radicals. By the way, they practice Islam. And by the way, they take verses out of context from the Quran. So those three components that there, you know, there should be no compulsion religion, the word mercy and merciful, compassionate, and um, you know, as also attributes of the God ha in Islam has 99 names, uh, peace, justice, uh, and uh, mercy and compassionate are among them. And the fact that the word Islam stems from the silm, which is the meaning of peace. Thank you.